So the topic I'm speaking to you about is called human enteroids, uh, and, uh, which is a, the purpose of which is to understand intestinal physiology and disease and to develop drug therapy. And the real theme of what I'm talking about and the reason we got into this it deals with the question, why don't we have adequate drug treatment for uh, diarrheal diseases and intestinal insufficiency, which is a big lack. So Jin Lu talked about the problems with getting drugs and uh, some used to be a lot of good luck. And in gastroenterology, uh, we have, haven't had such good luck. So this is, uh, these are hu human small intestinal enteroids just to give you a picture of what I'm going to be speaking about. These are actually uh, from biopsies, and they represent the functional unit of the intestine. And uh, I'm going to tell you about these, but I wanted you to see them before I got rolling with my talk. Now, in terms of what drugs we have for treating diarrhea, uh, when I said we had bad luck, our best drug was found 400 BC. We haven't come up with anything better. And this is an opiate, an opiate called paragoric, and that's still our best drug. When I, I see lots of patients with chronic diarrhea, and when nobody can get them better, this drug usually makes, the, makes their quality of life greatly improve. But it seems to me that 400 BC is a long time not that it made much of an improvement. So that's why we got into what we're talking about. So um, in this talk, I'm going to have three sections. One, I'll tell you why uh, diarrheal diseases are a big problem to set the stage of what we need to get drugs for. Second, I'll give you a very brief primer on uh, our understanding of the pathobiology of diarrhea, what we're trying to achieve in therapy. And then I'm going to tell you about these enteroids because it's a new, I think, quite exciting area. So in GI, we have lots of patients. And uh, the extent of these diseases in terms of the morbidity and mortality was written about in two publications, one in 2002 that I was part of, and one more recently by Jay Everhart from the NIH. So I'll now tell you about the problems with diarrheal diseases. They are predominantly a problem of uh, developing countries where the children less than five years of age are the major target. Uh, in these countries, the, these children average 3.2 episodes of acute diarrhea per year. And we're making some progress, decreasing that number per kid. But the number of kids are increasing, so the total number of cases in the world are not getting any less. In fact, they're probably getting more. But the reason you hear about diarrheal disease in developing countries is not the frequency, it's the mortality that's associated with these diarrheal diseases. Diarrhea accounts for 20% of the mortality of children less than five years of age. In fact, there's 1.2 million deaths of di from diarrhea per year. And if you just try to imagine what 1.2 million bodies piled up would be, it really just blows your mind. It makes you feel that how can you not be wanting to do something about this? Uh, we are making progress. The mortality in 1990 was two and a half times more. So it's not that we're, there's nothing occurring, but the numbers are just uh, um, unbelievable. And uh, each case, you have a 0.15% uh, chance of dying from each time you get diarrhea in these countries. And till now, the main thing that saved lives was use of these so-called oral rehydration solutions, which are electrolyte solutions, which are uh, glucose or another material like glucose amino acids, say, with sodium that drives absorption even though the diarrhea <coughs> continues. Problem is, in the countries, it's really quite labor intensive on the families to get these kids to get that fluid into them. And the use has dropped off. It's now used to be as high as 60%, 68%. Now it's dropped down to 33%. Um, so drugs really are needed. Now, what about in the United States? Is acute diarrhea a big deal in the United States? Well, in fact, uh, it is a, a big deal. It's a business of $3 billion a year. There are 211 million cases of diarrhea, acute diarrhea in the United States per year, uh, such that uh, each, since there are 300 million people, it's two out of three people get in a case of diarrhea each year. Deaths are quite small in the young, however. Uh, in fact, it's been about 200 deaths for a long time. But with the rotoviral uh, vaccines that are now being widely used, that is, is plummeting, and we don't think that's going to be uh, such a major issue. However, diarrhea killing is a major problem in the United States, not for the very young, but for the very old. And there's only a single study, shockingly, that was done 
in which uh, the mortality of 85% of deaths occurred in old people in an in-hospital population. And with a large number of people in nursing homes, it, it's looking as if uh, diarrheal diseases are replacing pneumonia. Pneumonia used to be called old man's friend. For debilitated people, they often die of pneumonia. Now it seems that this has shifted to diarrhea, killing a lot of the aged population. And how much, how big a problem just hasn't been studied enough to give us the numbers, but we know that there are huge numbers of people coming in dehydrated and dying. Now, chronic diarrhea, diarrhea lasting more than a month, is also a big problem, and it causes the same financial burden, $3 billion a year. But you notice that the number of cases are really much smaller, just 3 million cases. So how can that be? Why is such a, instead of 211 million costing 3 billion, why is 3 million costing 2 billion? And the reason is the second disease that you're going to hear about called intestinal insufficiency. Uh, there are only 50,000 cases of intestinal insufficiency. That means you don't have enough intestine to give you the nutrition you need to stay alive. And these, the causes for uh, intestinal insufficiency are listed here. In children, there's a disease called necrotizing enterocolitis. And in all kinds of people, surgery done for Crohn's disease, surgical complications, or ischemia, which means too little blood flow, which is an aged, uh, which happens in the aged population. Uh, are the major causes of uh, intestinal ischemia. Why is it so expensive? Because we now have an artificial nutrition system called CPNs, Central Peripheral Nutrition. It used to call, be called TPN, Total Peripheral Nutrition. You can keep people alive not having any intestine. You can give them all their nutri nutrients uh, each year, uh, e each day, and you can have them weigh anything you want them to weigh, but it's very expensive, $100,000 per person per year. But it does mean that we are able to preserve life uh, until we can figure out what to do. And part of what these enteroids are can potentially be used for is to produce artificial intestines, and I'll tell you about that. All right, so that's the first part. Uh, second part is the, a, a primer on the pathogenesis of diarrhea. What should we, what causes diarrhea in terms of what causes this loss of fluid and electrolytes? And if we're going to have a drug that fixes it, what are we aiming to fix? So diarrheal diseases are abnormal intestinal water and electrolyte homeostasis. You can, if, you, if you visualize a person having diarrhea, you think of a lot of water being produced in stool. But in fact, that's salt that's being lost. And the gut absorbs sodium and secretes chloride, two electrolytes. And that balance of the absorption and secretion defines normal bowel habits. In diarrheal diseases, every diarrheal disease is some combination of inhibition of sodium absorption and stimulation of chloride secretion. And that is the basic concept of diarrheal diseases. Now, there is more to it than that, of course, and I'll tell you just a little bit more. The cells that do sodium absorption and chloride secretion are different. This is a, a light micrograph of a human small intestine and a human colon. And the cells that do absorption are sodium-absorbing cells, and they are in the uh, upper part of the intestine called the villus, or the surface of the colon. The cells that do secretion are chloride secretory cells, and they're in these places called the crypts, which is the source of the st human stem cells. That's a part of the intestine that produces all the cells in the intestine, but it also produces cells that do chloride secretion. This is a cartoon version of the sodium absorbing cell. And I'm not going to go into any kind of details. The major way you absorb sodium in the period between meal meals is a process called neutral sodium chloride absorption, in which sodium and chloride are absorbed together. And there is a sodium hydrogen exchanger in the apical membrane called NHE3, sodium hydrogen exchanger type 3. And it is the target in virtually all diarrheal diseases. There are 125 diarrheal diseases you can find in a textbook. And everyone that's been studied has inhibition of NAT3 as a major component. So that would be a drug target to try to improve treatment for diarrhea. This is the chloride secretory cell. And the main player here is something you've probably all heard about called CFTR, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. And it is a chloride channel. And it gets turned on in many diarrheal diseases, not all, but many diarrheal diseases. So 
So inhibition of sodium absorption and stimulation of chloride secretion are what defines the pathobiology of diarrheal diseases. So if the pathogenesis in diarrhea is understood, why have we failed to develop drug treatment? Right? Seems like pretty straightforward, right? I show it to you in three slides. How hard can it be? Well, we th this meeting that we ran at the NIH, uh, the purpose was to ask that question. Why don't we have drugs? What are we lacking? And we got experts from around the world, and we had several conclusions. It obviously wasn't one thing. But one of the major conclusions uh, was that we really didn't understand human uh, intestinal function. We understood cells, often cancer cells, and we understood animals. But the FDA has made it very clear that if you develop drugs based on cells and animals, you end up having 90% of the things you think are good drugs not going to work in man. And you need to study, and the reason that Strin was telling, telling you, so expensive, there are a lot of drugs that come along the way and look really promising in animals and cells, but when you take them to man, they either have a lot of toxicity or they have in, in, inappropriate or in, inadequate function. So 90% fail, and that leads to at least part of the huge expense, billion dollars, to develop a single drug. So lack of drug development using human intestine. So that was a goal that clearly came out of this meeting. So I'm now going to tell you about how we decided to develop uh, a human model for developing drugs for treating diarrhea and intestinal insufficiency. So this work that led to what I'm going to tell you about, human enteroids, was carried out by a spectacular scientist named Hans Klevers, who's at the Hubert Institute in the Utrecht in, in the Netherlands. And you were discussing stem cells when I came in the door, and he discovered the intestinal stem cell. And this is a, the same picture that you saw before. I'll just go back to it to make sure. Yeah. Here is a intestinal villus cryptaxis. And that's what this is. Here is the villus, and here is the crypt. And he discovered that the stem cells were at the base of the crypt, and they had a characteristic that they had a marker called LGR5 that, that marked the positive cells. That is a receptor for a, a hormone called r -spondin. And he was able to, by understanding the, this receptor and these cells, he was able to generate a series of growth factors, a mixture, that you could take a small biopsy of intestine, put it in a dish, petri dish, sprinkle it with these growth factors, and they would become eternally propagating. So you could take a, so that's what it is, and that's what human enteroids are. They are biopsies from human intestine which grow and can form a functional, physiologically relevant piece of intestine in a, in a culture. It's called an ex vivo culture. So that brings us to what we're trying to do with this model. Now, I give Cleavers all the credit. He's a spectacular scientist, helpful to all of us. And we learned from him how to carry out uh, this creation of human enteroids. And we proposed to the NIH uh, a project. And it's called Human Small Intestinal Enteroids as a Preclinical Testing Platform for Anti-Diarrheal Drug Development. And this is a grant that uh, we were able to get from NCATS. And NCATS is, called, is, as you knew, know, the new center from uh, Francis Collins called the National Center for the Advancement of Translational Sciences. And we were lucky enough to get one of the first grants, the first grants that they gave out. And it, this is a collaborative grant between NCATS, the FDA, because they're so worried about lack of development of drugs, and DARPA, which is part of the Defense Department. <coughs> and the goal was to develop uh, human tissues in a dish where you could do drug testing as well as study physiology. And this grant is held by myself with Olga Kabatsnik, who's an associate professor in our department, Nick Zakos, an assistant professor. Uh, we got it as a collaborative grant with Mary Estes, who's one of the world's leaders in uh, understanding viral viruses that affect the gastrointestinal tract. She's the one helping develop the norovirus uh, vaccine. And we did it in collaboration with an old friend, Hugo de Jong, who's from Erasmus and works with the Utrecht group. So that's what I'm going to tell you about.